well, it's great to see um, such a lot of uh, people here tonight because it's um, pretty wet and rainy. So thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a really interesting evening. Um, look, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the partnership between the University of Sydney and the Planning Institute. Um, forums <coughs> such as this one are essential if we as a planning profession are going to publicly address some of the key topics um, that affect how we plan and critically how we reflect and support the community's needs and <coughs> desires. And before I hand over to our speaker tonight, um, I'd like to touch on the peer response to some of the matters raised by Elizabeth Farrelly in her article on the 26th of May, and also the broader planning um, context for those issues. Um, I actually, um, of all the, I guess, editorials and pieces on planning, um, that have gone on in the media in terms of planners contacting me or people generally. I got a lot of response when Elizabeth Farrelly um, wrote her editorial piece, uh, her opinion piece. So she certainly struck a nerve um, and I think that she, um, she did make some very good points. And I also um, think that um, it's good to um, raise the debate um, um, and, and have sort of lectures like this this evening. But I would, however, like to assure you that um, planners are alive and well, and I'm sure there's a, you know, there's a good few of you in the, the room, and still have their passion for making a difference. And I've been a planner for a long time, and I'm, you know, um, I've been in government for a long time, but I'm, I'm still an optimist, and I think a lot of planners are. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be. You know, it's not all bad, it's all good stuff um, And I think that planners do make a difference every day, and I, I hope that I'm sure that Pat will talk about that as well. Um, and a case in point is that planners in a real world advocate for improved, improved transport, community services to match housing growth, and for those services to be provided in advance of any development. And the reality is that this is not always the case, and at times it's not possible for a number of reasons. And what PIA continues to advocate for is a planning system that will address this through adherence to planning frameworks that are endorsed by the communities that they serve. And this is an ambitious aim, um, I hear you say, um, but we must continue to advocate for this and to hold our decision makers and lawmakers on us. There has been progress, and P has been advocating for a long time um, to have federal uh, recognition of planning. We've got a new uh, chief uh, planner in the department, and also a Greater Sydney Commission. And I'm really um, hoping that the Commission uh, will do some great things in terms of, of planning and infrastructure planning for the city. Um, we must get changes right. They need to be responsive to the challenges of a growing and changing state while supporting the needs of our communities. As a sound platform for addressing those big issues of housing affordability, employment, transport and infrastructure. And there's always going to be differing public, professional and political opinions and reactions in any rapidly changing city. But discussion and debate is healthy, and we shouldn't shy away from it. However, as planning professionals, we must be prepared at times to make hard decisions, based though on sound planning principles. And planning to me is inherently focused on facilitation and balance, where both the public and many different private interests are accommodated. This should occur without compromising good design, creation of place, amenity, and livability. And this is known as the public interest. And on this note, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Pat Fetcher. And I'm sure many of you know, will know Pat, but he's a highly experienced urban planner and the national leader for urban governance and policy at SGS. He holds specialist expertise in many areas, including metropolitan and strategic planning, infrastructure planning and funding analysis, cultural development, regional economic development, development feasibility analysis, the only thing you don't do, Pat, and facility <laughs> audits and planning. And he's a lead consultant on Sustainable Sydney 2030 for the Sydney of Sydney 
Uh, Patrick is the 2015 winner of the prestigious New South Wales Planning Institute of Australia's President's Award for Planning Ex uh, Excellence. I'd like to put hands for you. Thanks, Marjorie, and um, thank you for Peter and the University for hosting this great event. It is important that we come together to have these sort of conversations. Um, so I'm actually going to read most of my speech tonight. Normally I wouldn't do that, but I have uh, put a bit of effort into reading it, so I'm going to get the, the red version so that I um, say everything I want to say rather than forget something. So, um, so tonight I want to talk about refocusing and re-energising planning around big public interest challenges facing Sydney and remind the audience, which I, and I think there are a bunch of some students here, uh, that planning is not just about producing two-dimensional plans or even worthy strategic planning documents. And it is certainly not just about ticking or crossing boxes as part of the development approval process. Thankfully, in my view, and it's been referred to by Marjorie, um, I think the context for proper thoughtful planning in Sydney, which focuses on the public interest, is, is looking up with the, um, with the Greater Sydney Commission, likely to be particularly interested in the sort of things I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and if the Greater Sydney Commission fails, then we're in real trouble. <laughs> so um, we're, we're, it's in all of our interests to, um, to see that project succeed and to, and to hope that it does lift our sights. So um, it is important that planners seize the opportunity to get involved and, and, and claim a role in addressing these critical challenges. Um, so Elizabeth Farrelly's article, as referred to by Marjorie, um, decrying the absence of traditional public interest centred planning perspectives or critiques in recent city development and investment decisions created a minor stir in the news cycle, particularly amongst the planning industry. Um, setting aside some of the references to particular projects she took issue with, which uh, might be debated, it's hard to argue with her critique of firstly the absence of a strong planning perspective in some government decisions where conflict, conflict of interest seemed present. And this is nearly always a variant on the tension between government as both regulator and landowner slash developer slash beneficiary. Um, and, and that creates a tension and problem for government which uh, it, it very rarely avoids <laughs> avoids. Um, and secondly, she wrote about the marginalisation of planners or planning in government decision making. <coughs> Another thing she mentioned that resonated with me was the reference to a time when planners spoke straight, defended the public, changed the world, and being a professional meant standing up for principle, not bending over for money, and planning's first principle was public benefit. And one of the things I love about being a partner and principal at SGS Economics and Planning is working with young, idealistic and talented people who are genuinely committed to doing high quality work in the interests of a better future. Uh, there are young people out there, there's lots of them. Um, and the young graduates, uh, and these young graduate planners do want to change the world for the better and even the graduate economists we employ want to change the world. <laughs> At SGS, uh, the public interest is our reason for being. It's the reason we're in business. We're not in business, we're not, we're not doing public interest work to, 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 make it, to have a business. We're doing, uh, we have a business so that we can do public interest work. And I'm happy, therefore, that we provide a pathway for the young idealists to pursue their passions and interests. But Elizabeth is right. The public interest perspective is often missing or misunderstood in planning. And too often planners, particularly at the government level, are effectively development facilitators. And don't get me wrong, of course we need development with given our high rates of population growth. So there's nothing wrong in itself with being a development facilitator. The problem is it isn't the career path that most young planning students choose. And it shouldn't be confused with proper planning, which is about taking a big picture view and ensuring that the public interest is ultimately served. So, there are lots of reasons for the, the retreat of planning, but here's, here's a few, or three. The first reason um, is the contemporary neoliberal or dry economics perspective which prevails in public policy and practice. The strongest strands of this ideology have view viewed planners as just getting in the way of the market and as recalling some sort of socialist-style central control. The neoliberal perspective is highly suspicious of planning. <coughs> 
and it has a strong influence in central agencies such as state treasuries, which are increasingly involved in policy making across government, including in planning and development fields. Unfortunately, the rise of neoliberalism in public policy making has occurred at the same time as planning schools have done away with educating young planners in the basics of economics, including urban economics. So on the whole, planning graduates have next to no exposure to the world in which economists inhabit, and the disconnect is startling, and planners are left behind in the internal debates within government, unable to hold their own in discussions focused on the economic merits of, of policies and investments. Secondly, planning has been marginalised within government. As neoliberalism has grown in influence and the suspicion of planning has increased, increased the strategic and future planning effort has been downgraded. This has occurred at the same time as the focus on big infrastructure and big spending projects has grown. The spending agencies within government alongside the central agency, agencies of Premier and Cabinet and Treasury tend to hold sway when it comes to in, internal debates and decisions in government. And we could, we could point to projects such as West Connects, where really the planners have been at the complete margins of decisions about that sort of project. <clears throat> Thirdly, because planning has in many instances been reduced to what I described earlier as development facilitation, and a lot of development is occurring in, a fa in our fast growing cities, that is where the jobs are. Both outside government as consultants to, to developers and inside government in project assessment. The vast majority of, of so-called planners in Australia would be involved in effectively assisting development through the system rather than trying to better understand or plan for a better future. Unfortunately, this conflation of planning and development facilitation is affecting how the community sees planners. Um, and this is the perspective that Elizabeth, Elizabeth in some ways is getting, getting at. She's saying, so, so where once the community might have seen planners as visionaries, um, perhaps they now see us as not, not much more than development <coughs> advocates or development pimps. <clears throat> the clustering of planners in, in, de in development facilitation processes has also made it difficult for the planning profession as such to talk with one voice or advocate for, cl for clear public interest positions and Marjorie and the colleagues at Pia would, would, would feel this intensely at times. Unfortunately, public interest positions may be at odds with the interest that planners being, are being paid to represent. This internal professional conflict is perhaps one reason why our profession is silent or absent in many of the pressing public interest debates of the day. We need to be concerned and speak of the development policy issues, speak to the development policy issues that most people are concerned about. Now, the dominance of neoliberal thinking in public policy and its consequences giving rise to the type of resistance amongst communities that is now being reflected in political outcomes around the world. As our biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne, grow faster than they've ever done and head towards 8 million people each by about 2050, business as usual won't do. There is an urgent need for better thinking about the consequences of and responses to economic change and rapid urban development in Australia. And planning should be the profession where this sort of work occurs. And I noticed that Ang noted that Angus Taylor, the Federal Assistant C Cities Minister, agrees. Just in The Guardian, in the last few days, he says the political disruption is coming for the outer suburbs and regional cities and that people are crying out for solutions. So planning should be at the, core bit, at the, at the heart and is core business in the political response uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, um, to the demands and to the problems that these fringe areas and these outer suburbs and the regional cities have. So, um, what is the public interest in planning? Well, not with, notwithstanding the market faith of the neoliberals, um, market failures remain. These market failures result in cost, which the community has to bear and rectify. And in the language of economics, these community-wide costs are called negative externalities. And this is where planning needs to concentrate its, its efforts, efforts and intervene. Where there is intervention, the public interest tests should be based on assessing whether net community benefits will be generated from the intervention. That is, benefits outweigh costs across the economic, environmental, social and governance dimensions. However, this in in interpretation of the public interest anticipates losers as well as beneficiaries, though with overall community welfare maximised. Not everyone or every interest can necessarily benefit from policy decisions. <coughs> 
planners should understand and be clear that this may, may be the case. So we planners need to be able to say there will be losers from decisions, but overall the community is, is benefits. And that's a difficult thing for politicians to do, of course, but planners should be uh, able to provide that advice if necessary. So if planners should be prepared um, to get involved and intervene where there is market failure, and if the public interest test for the intervention requires benefits to be greater than the cost, then planners need to be equipped with the tool to argue these cases um, or perspectives. And, that, and this harks back to what I said initially, that, that a lot of planners aren't equipped to take on these arguments and to argue that the benefits outweigh the costs. And so planning education has a real challenge to step up to the plate and um, uh, introduce those sort of concepts in teaching our young planners. So that's by way of introduction. So in my view, planners would deal themselves into relevance again if they were prominent in debates and were setting the agenda in relation to these four big contemporary issues as well as others, but in my view, these keep recurring in the work that we do. A public interest or net community benefit perspective is relevant to them all. And so they are urban geographic inequality. How should we invest in urban infrastructure in the future to address acute and increasing spatial social disadvantage in our big cities? Promoting livable renewal. How can we ensure the quality of life improves as we remake the city through renewal. At the housing crisis, um, what can planning do to address the affordable housing problem? And value sharing for urban infrastructure, topic of the day, what is the best way to capture a share of the uplift in land, value, in land values caused by planning and state investment for funding public benefits? Now that's a right relevant, exciting public interest agenda which planners could be focusing on and getting passionate about. And so for each of these, I'd like to suggest some ideas worthy of further development and attention. And I initially started preparing this uh, pr presentation with the sort of um, anger in me that Elizabeth was uh, writing uh, with. But then I thought, well, I could complain, but I might as well try to be constructive about a few things. So that's where I've ended up trying to, trying to suggest some solutions around some of these issues. Um, okay. So, addressing urban geographic inequality. You're all familiar with this, these sort of images. Sydney is a socially divided city. Whichever indicator one chooses to use, use, whether it be shown here, income, unemployment, or oil vulnerability, the north and east are more advantaged than the west and south. There is a northwest to southwest socioeconomic fault line that runs through the metropolis. And it's getting worse. The red areas in the last graphic here show the parts of the city which are already high income, where incomes grew the most between 2006 and 2011. They're concentrated near the Sydney CBD and in the eastern suburbs and the lower North Shore. And the CIFA socioeconomic index small area scores are summarised on this map and the socioeconomic fault line between the advantage and disadvantage is pronounced. So does this matter? Well, it didn't used to matter so much. In the second half of the 20, I mean, this pattern of, of, of wealth and inequality, uh, wealth and, and, and disadvantage, has been a reasonably prominent one throughout um, Sydney's uh, 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 development. But it didn't, and so, it, but it didn't used to matter so much because in the second half of the 20th century, the suburbs grew rapidly based on cheap fuel, the motor car, and low density housing. But jobs were dispersed, of course, in shopping centres, schools, and institutions medical facilities, but most importantly, we had a manufacturing uh, workforce and, 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 and jobs constituted more than 20, manufacturing jobs constituted more than 25% of the workforce and where were they? In the suburbs. So lower skilled and lower income workers in the suburbs had ready access to those secure uh, jobs. So with more open global markets leading to economic restructuring, the share of employment in manufacturing declined rapidly to less than 10% of employment by the current decade, while employment in services exploded, <coughs> constituting when broadly defined as per this graph to about 85% of the workforce. So while new jobs in services also grew in the suburbs, as we know a significant share of them, including uh, more of the higher value service jobs were concentrated in and around the centre of our major cities, including the CBD and Lower North Shore. 
So employment in general and higher value professional and business services employment in particular has clustered together in or nearer to the parts of the city where higher income and, higher, and, and more qualified residents and the more disadvantaged people live. And businesses locating in these areas are seeking the benefits from what are known as agglomeration economies. This is the enhanced productivity that comes from proximity to and the density of economic activity as a collaboration, comparison and competition encourages innovation and added value in the development and sale of goods and services. So a severe mismatch is now emerging between where the jobs are, and in particular where the good jobs are, and the, and the high paying jobs, and where the residents are, and this is the compounding, and this is compounding the spatial divide in Sydney. <coughs> so these two figures, I have them in nearly every presentation I give now <laughs> because they're so profound. Um, these two figures show the share of metropolitan Sydney's jobs that are accessible in a 30 minute travel time by private vehicle and by public transport in metropolitan Sydney. Not surprisingly, and consistent with the picture of the divided city we've already seen, they show that the west and southwest have the poorest access to employment in metropolitan Sydney. A resident in Liverpool, for example, is within 30 minute reach of the best 10% of all of the jobs in metropolitan Sydney by either car or public transport. This compares to a resident in central Sydney having access to 40% of metropolitan uh, Sydney's jobs. This relative accessibility to employment opportunities matters in terms of life prospects and potential, uh, uh, potential for upward mobility. While there is obviously a range of factors fueling social disadvantage, communities with constrained mobility and accessibility leading to a constrained array of job opportunities are much more likely to face entrenched disadvantage. It's just, a, it, their life prospects are worse than people who have access to more jobs and their likelihood of having a, uh, a, 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 a satisfactory income are less than those people who have access to a bigger range of jobs. The disadvantage at work here is hardening. And as we've seen in both peaceful, political and violent terrorist contexts around the world, disadvantage like this breeds discontent with all the costs to cohesion and productivity and harmony that this brings. So there is a real economic interest at stake here. This is a public interest issue. While planning can't be expected to find all the answers, of course, given the long running economic trends we're talking about and the labour market dimensions driving these sort of social outcomes. Because this is disadvantage in space, many of the issues here and the potential solutions fit squarely within the public interest in agenda of planning. And most neoliberally trained economists have no idea how to deal with this issue. And planners uh, should be the people who are talking about the answers. So what's to, be, so what's to be done? In my view, all of the big ticket or city shaping items of government expenditure, particularly transport infrastructure, should be assessed as to how they can address this agenda of metropolitan spatial social disadvantage by improving accessibility to a greater share of jobs. Traditional economic appraisal based on cost benefit analysis as currently practiced in Australia effectively ignores or at least sidelines this criteria. This criteria of these wider economic benefits and this, this issue of how you would distribute these jobs, uh, the access to these jobs are based on transport investments. So for transport project appraisals, the key metric is usually travel time savings, um, which for motorway projects are usually pretty illusory given the induced demand and the congestion status quo, which is quickly achieved once new capacity is provided. So for West Connect, for example, around about 50% of the benefits that are in the business case for that project are based on travel time savings. And that's assuming those travel time savings pretty well go on year after year after year after year. Now, my bet is, depending on how they price it, if they didn't price it, it would fill up completely, but it, those, can, those travel time savings may not be as uh, profound uh, as being assessed in that project. So in my view, the key metrics should be the growth in overall productivity from increased access to jobs, jobs. So we want 
the blue areas to get darker everywhere. But also we want increases in jobs in, in, in job accessibility in the disadvantaged suburbs and districts of Sydney. So the blue would get more smeared across the metropolitan area. The other key indicator is greenhouse emissions, which is um, such a great proxy for the use of private transport, as well, of course, uh, of, of pollutants and the costs of car use. So the second area I wanted to talk about is renewable renewal. So a plan for growing Sydney says metropolitan Sydney needs to accommodate around about 620,000 dwellings to 2031, or about 31,000 per year. These are high rates of growth, rarely matched by any period in Sydney in the past, and only comparable in Western cities to major global Sydney cities like <coughs> London and New York. Given housing preferences, it can be expected that at least 80% or so of the 620,000 will be in established parts of Sydney, equivalent to around 500,000 dwellings or about 25,000 dwellings per year. So that's 25,000 dwellings per year every year where Sydney is aiming to accommodate. The focus in the plan is rightly to concentrate these additional dwellings in the established areas of Sydney around railway stations Hence the blue worms uh, shown along the rail lines in the strategy map. And so, so far we've mostly accommodated infill growth by converting old industrial areas and elsewhere relying on incremental change within the capacity allowed by local development controls. To some extent this has worked quite well, but we are to some extent running out of sites and business as usual in managing this sort of growth will not be sustainable, particularly because of the ramp up of the rates that we're now talking about. So to focus growth in the infill areas well serviced by transport and existing infrastructure and facilities and to supplement this infrastructure as appropriate will re require new approaches to development and planning. And again, this is a public interest agenda that planners should be leading the way on. We should be insisting that communities see a positive dividend from the growth rather than a decline in our competitiveness and quality of life. So, Here's a uh, live example. The Sydney and the Bankstown corridor has been a recent focus for this type of renewal. A new metro style race, rail service is proposed here with three to six minute frequencies. <coughs> There's been some good work done here by the DP and its consultants, but so far it's, it's only scratched the surface of what's required in terms of a true integrated planning approach. So the plan is here, they've adopted the 400 metre radius and the 800 metre radius around these rail stations. Uh, these are the so-called walking radius and radiuses. And with some adjustments, the uh, approach here is, is to more or less have the highest densities within 400 metres, graduating down to lowest at 800 metres and, and beyond. Um, and this is a two-dimensional plan view of the world. I've never quite accepted the logic of this idea that the density should be staggered in this way only some of the future activity in the area will actually be focused on the station. Um, where opportunities for intensification exist beyond the immediate radius, then they should also be identified. The walk and catchment should be wider, up to 1,500 metres, about a 15 minute walk, and each precinct needs to be thought of as a complete community. And safely out of the way of densification. And I used to, when I walked to the station, I used to walk to the station um, every day. So I don't see why uh, my area gets safe. Not that I'm looking for the property out here. <laughs> I wasn't far from the station in the life of the Marrickville Centre, so um, uh, it seems to be a little bit of a constrained approach. Um, so the walk and catchment should be wider, up to 1,500 metres, and each of these precincts need to be thought of as a complete community. So uh, coming to the numbers, the Sydenham to Bankstown framework <coughs> identifies the potential for a further 46,000 dwellings in the corridor to, 20, to 2036. So going from uh, 45,000 up to 81,000 by 2036. So 46,000 dwellings. Presuming there will be some reasonable housing mix and an occupancy rate of about two, this implies around 100,000 extra people in 20 years. <coughs> 
So the equivalent of a new medium-sized town, twice the size of Bathurst, about half of Wollongong, right here in that corridor. So the plan is, um, I've identified some, some corridors, uh, improved potential, improved transport links, um, modest regional level open space links based on existing assets, and they've produced an infrastructure schedule, which for every single item here, it says the timing is to be determined as the corridor develops. <laughs> and the mechanism is assigned to the state government line agency or the local council through a section 94 contribution plan. So the implication is that with 100,000 new people in this corridor, business as usual, fragmented planning, catch-up planning, catch-up infrastructure planning will somehow suffice. The public interest test requires the community benefits overall increase in future. This needs stating, measuring and planning for. And so alongside this, uh, alongside this, a commitment to corridor length infrastructure planning and funding needs to be established. So, so to, to again, to illustrate the scale of the integrated planning infrastructure task in a corridor like this, it's worth contemplating just one aspect. That's the number of school places and school facilities that might be required. So, I did a little bit of homework here. A further 100,000 people is roughly equivalent to the current populations of the old local government areas of Ashfield and Marrickville. So that comes to about 110,000. So that, that's Ashfield and Marrickville again jammed into that into that corridor. So how many schools are in Ashfield and Marrickville? Um, these LGAs have give or take about 30 primary and 12 secondary schools in both the private and state sector. There are 26 schools in the state sector alone. So while the anticipated age profile of incoming residents needs to be assessed, of course, and not everyone's going to be in school age, along with the capacity of existing schools, it's clear that a very significant growth in school capacity will be needed. The infrastructure schedule says that, uh, that the, the, the problem is going to be dealt with by the 15-year school asset strategic plan, which is due for delivery in 2016. Uh, have we any confidence that this will show how new school places will be provided and how they will be integrated with new communities and transport systems in this corridor? It's a big task. There's some detail provided on local open space planning, but again, this is also more or less left to the future um, to be presumably resolved by councils on an ad hoc negotiated basis. Um, and it does recognise the need for new and improved community facilities, however, uh, the strategy is light on for detail. Um, then goes on to say that the future precinct planning for the corridor will include more detailed analysis to support a potential rezoning. Well, that's, that's a relief. This will assess indicative costs, delivery timeframes and suitable infrastructure funding arrangements. And it does, interestingly, and I'll come to this in a minute, but leave open the door for value capture mechanisms to provide future funding. It says, the New South Wales Government is investigating a range of funding sources for infrastructure to support the strategy. This will include mechanisms which enable the Government to share the value uplift created by increased development density and investment in better infrastructure and services. Um, most planning strategies have said some variant of that in the last 10 years, but um, it's in there. Um, but my concern is that this approach to planning doesn't uh, recognise the difficulty of retrofitting sites for schools, community facilities, local open space and education facilities into established areas. The original subdivisions were robust and reflected inter integrated planning for new development with some terrace housing, but mostly detached housing, through this corridor. Sites were reserved for open space and schools and the obligations on landowners and developers to provide land for such facilities were pretty clear. A much clearer statement of livability outcomes, principles and approaches to infrastructure and facility provision in the corridor is required. Something which at least provides a signal for the developer to beware. And I've got friends in Marrickville who have already been approached <laughs> about their willingness to sell their houses. So I wonder if these developers, with all the goodwill in the world, are factoring in that sites may be needed for community facilities and open space. It seems to me that we need much more sophisticated thinking around pooled approaches and government interventions in the land market um, to realise such outcomes. And just yesterday, um, uh, we saw this about uh, the distribution of livability in our city. And not surprising, look at the pattern. Um, you might have seen, seen this report. The map shows the familiar pattern. Um, a, livable, a more livable blue or green east and a less livable red or yellow west and southwest. As the city grows and densifies, 
planners should be pushing for the green and blue areas to spread and intensify. The, should, the, the, the city should get more livable all over, not less. We have no way of knowing whether the metropolis as a whole and the districts and places within it are getting better unless we set targets based on a common set of indicators. SGS has undertaken some work for SS Rock, which has looked at the sort of indicators which should be considered. Rod Simpson, who's going to be talking tomorrow night, has long advocated for this sort of approach. And we've got firms like Kinesis, which have developed sophisticated sustainability measurement tools at a precinct level. So we're we're starting to develop a toolkit to actually think about this in a more serious way. And, but more work needs to be done and of course this is absolutely fertile territory for planners. So the sort of indicators which need to be adopted are shown here on the slide. <coughs> while, in, while expectations in the indicators might vary depending on the location within the metropolitan area and while the response, responses will be different depending on, for example, the existing capacity of facilities, it's important to give communities confidence that a positive livability and sustainability agenda is being pursued where they live and that the new development about which they tend to be so suspicious has an upside. The other reason, this is a critical one, that adopting ambitious livability targets in these places slated for change is so important is that across large parts of the city much will not change much. There's going to be a lot of areas of detached housing away from transport connections which don't change particularly much. So if we've got metropolitan-wide ambitions for a more livable, sustainable, productive city, then it's important that the main gains are made in places where the change is going to occur. Um, otherwise, we never have any hope of achieving the sum of the parts that we expect or hope that we will. So it's really important that we understand what those corridors and clusters and renewal locations are contributing in terms of better outcomes. There's also an urgent need to rethink, to think about who will be housed in these renewal areas. A lot of the recent renewal area planning work takes a, a build it and they will come approach and in a hot market this is likely to be the case as we've seen. But it isn't based on housing market analysis and the idea of strengthening community through ensuring an appropriate housing mix. It might be hard to, to pin down with data, but we instinctively know that where there is diversity across a metropolis, mixing up the diversity builds more resilience. It's not drawing a long bow to suggest that overly homogeneous communities are not only less vibrant, if not outright boring. Have you been to, I'll even say Anandar these days. <laughs> um, they're less, less tolerant of difference. And this, again, harking back to a, perhaps a, a bigger motivation for getting this right, is that they, these uh, outcomes in cities breed discontent and anxiety. In addition to a mix of housing types and product, likely to be encouraged if the renewal area boundaries were based on a greater radius from the station. So if we just lock in the 400 and 800 and we say that's where the, the development's going to come, we've locked in the densities and we're typically going to get apartments. If we think a bit wider, then we're likely to get a more mixed variety of forms, townhouses and granny flats and uh, ponds and flats and all the rest of it. Um, so in addition to a mix of housing types and product, which would be encouraged by this wider geographic view, there should be a requirement for integrated renewal areas to have a minimum share of social and affordable housing. Inclusionary zoning, which mandates, say, 5% affordable housing for the community sector as part of the infrastructure of the area, just like a minimum amount of open space, should apply in all locations. So it's like the environmental fabric of the place. We need open space, and in Victoria it's long been mandated that the minimum is 5%. We should be mandating the same sort of outcome in terms of social mix for our area. Governments should commit to funding a further tranche of say 5 to 10 percent of low income housing, whether through direct development or purchase of social housing, which at times could help underwrite private sector development, or through supplementing returns on bonds issued to private finances and affordable housing. And we've seen an announcement just in the last week in relation to that, which is really encouraging. Much more thinking is also required about car parking in these areas. And last night we got a little bit of a uh, feel for the change around mobility 
and what that might mean for some of these, the, the, the walkability uh, within these station precincts, etc. But much more thinking is required of our car parking. Providing basement or podium parking in new apartment developments near stations not only increases the cost of development in areas where we want lower to middle income people to live, it also locks in car use and ownership. The evidence shows that all over Sydney, a high share of households live without cars near stations. In some of the small areas highlighted on this map, near Hornsby Station, up to 41% of households don't own a car. So these dark and red areas, right near Hornsby Station, people are deciding not to own cars. So we should be encouraging and facilitating this trend, not trying to reverse it by, by pulling down dwellings or building more housing with associated lots of car parking. Of course people will want cars in future, but there's plenty of housing with car spaces attached in Sydney and new housing with parking can be built beyond the immediate station area. Let the people prepared to live, let the people prepared to live without a car be next to the station with the best public transport access. It just makes sense from a planning point of view. We're doing the exact opposite. And it's partly because developers in a lot of locations make a big profit on having car parking in their uh, developments. Housing for all. I'm going to skip through this because um, I, I've got a lot to say here, but I have to say something on this because the journalist who's covering my speech was most interested in this aspect and she's going to report things in the paper which I better make sure I say tonight. So, <laughs> uh, so um, this is an area for planners to be outraged, of course, um, and we should be. Uh, but given the tragedy of the homeless epidemic affecting Sydney and Melbourne, and the terrible consequences of a lack of, affording, of housing affordability in our cities. Planners need to refocus on this issue and adopt clear positions to challenge the lazy thinking that often blames planning for the problem, while, while also we also need it to put positive proposals to change. So I had a whole bunch of slides here, which I've hidden, which I was going to talk more about the impacts of low-income housing, but I suspect I'm preaching to the converted, so I'll go to this slide here. There's no simple answer to accumulated housing stress and market dysfunction, but planners should be advocating loudly and passionately for comprehensive government responses that include a focus on more efficient supply processes, but also planning mechanisms and additional interventions to boost lower price supply, and I've referred to some of those uh, in relation to the livable renewal agenda. It isn't sufficient to continue arguing or hoping that increased market-based supply will solve the problem. And it's staggering that this argument keeps being pushed when the recent evidence clearly doesn't support it. The dry economists clutch onto the hope that the supply chain can be sufficiently oiled to meet demand by reducing planning controls or planning getting out of the way and allowing the market to respond. They don't account for the need to maintain urban amenity while increasing supply massive challenge for planners. We want to keep our heritage, we want to keep our terraces, we know that that adds to livability and amenity, so we don't want to change those areas, we've got to find new supplies, so planners are in the middle of all this. Um, so they don't account for this need to maintain urban amenity while increasing supply, don't account for the infrastructure cost constraints well beyond the control of planners, and we know that issues of greenfield supply for many years were less about um, uh, zoning for residential development and more about the funding in the like that Sydney Water has to spend um, uh, on new housing. And they don't account for the myriad of housing market characteristics and policy interventions that distort any prospect of um, supply <coughs> meeting needs at a range of price points. So Peter Phipps will recognise this one, he sent this to me. Um, it, this says it all. So rather than house prices moderating as supply increases, have actually relatively closely tracked new supply in Sydney in recent years. So this confounds, confounds the economists. So it's far from a lack of supply being a planning failure, as is often suggested, the planning system is now enabling new housing in Sydney to produce at an impressive rate, close to the highest we've seen in the last 30 years at least. Reforms to land release, greenfields planning and infrastructure provision from six or seven years ago and earlier are now bearing fruit. 
corresponding with the hot property market, which has made many pro more projects feasible. Craig Niles is thinks in the room, he's responsible for a few of those changes a few years ago, and so we've seen this uptick in supply. <coughs> and in fact, the, because of the lead times it takes to get our act together in development and infrastructure provision in greenfield areas, the current government actually can't take too much uh, credit for this upswing. It started uh, from the reforms uh, some years ago. But additional supply hasn't moderated prices, and there are many reasons why this is the case. And um, this is what the journalist was interested in, so I do have to say a few of these. A, a few relevant reasons include the following, and this I thought was fascinating. This is the Reserve Bank of Australia in their submission to the Affordable Housing Inquiry. Uh, their paper said, the RBA it suggested that Australia has a constraint to providing new housing at a reasonable cost because its population and settlement structure, including the concentration of urban population comp competing for housing, includes the concentration of urban population which is competing for housing in just two large cities. So we've basically got everyone in Australia wanting to live in two places. I mean, anyone who's you know, got big aspirations and wants to change the world and you know, do knowledge, so that's, that's a no, I'm probably writing off a lot of the non rest rest of Australia, but you get the idea, the characterisation I'm trying to make. So we've got two places where, which are really hot, which people want to get to. Um, and that, of course, uh, uh, has a follow-on impact in terms of the cost of building. Uh, so there's inflation in the cost of building, and I've um, had some experience of that, first-hand experience of that. So this RBA paper actually says, um, it acknowledges that there may be a limit to the extent Regulatory or planning changes can address supply sufficiently to impact on affordability. We've just got a city which is difficult to do anything about because we've got um, you know, a lot of pressures. So consistent with that perspective, there are not many tier one or tier two global cities. There's global interest in getting a toehold in these cities, which has accelerated in recent years in parts of Sydney and Melbourne. So while a while small share of the market, the paradise and, and paradigms and rules governing much of the foreign investment which is going into some of these places may be quite different to those for Australian investors. So they're, they're operating to a different rule set to what we would understand to be the demand supply relationships. Um, okay, also we know Australian investors in housing are supported by tax incentive and this has driven demand and squeezed owner buyers. Um, the housing market is different. Housing unlike other, other goods doesn't clear out. New, new housing only makes up 1% to 2% of the annual increment of total supply. So we're only adding a little bit on the edges every year. And prices are set by the established market, um, and, and a market of tax-assisted investors and, um, and uh, wealthy incumbent homeowners. So they're all just trading amongst themselves, <laughs> really, in, in the housing market. Uh, so without a significant injection of lower price supply, there's no disruption to these higher price points. Uh, and Geoffrey Mean, uh, Peter again sent me a, a piece from Geoffrey Mean who was here. Uh, he recently pointed out at Sydney University that general increases in housing supply have only a limited impact on affordability unless they are large and sustained and are accompanied by changes in fiscal policy and taxation policy and the like. So it's a complex issue. Um, so, as important as it is, if oiling the wheels of market-based supply won't be sufficient to meet demand, then what else is required? And I agree with Lord Kerslake from the UK, and Lord Kerslake is the, was the uh, Under Secretary of the Department, and he was quoted by Geoffrey Lean, and he said, it's simply not possible to deliver the new housing the country needs, that's the UK, but the same applies here, without building more houses of all types and tenures, including social housing. So um, I've already alluded in the Livable Renewal Agenda to some of the um, other planning mechanisms, but we also just need to be putting the pressure on governments to spend more on the old-fashioned social housing, as well as other innovative financing mechanisms which they're looking at. So the last um, topic area is value capture. Um, and it's suddenly flavour of the month. As I say, it's been mentioned <coughs> quietly in a number of planning documents over the years. Uh, the Prime Minister's talking about it, so everyone else is. Uh, the idea is that part of the increment in land value that follows a public decision on rezoning or investment in infrastructure should be returned to the community rather than kept by the landowner as a windfall gain. 
as I mentioned, the Prime Minister, the New South Wales Minister for, for Transport, and, and private proponents of fast or high-speed rail projects have been pushing it as a means of providing additional funding for public benefit works or infrastructure. Planners should be natural supporters of value capture as a means of funding because they see what happens to land values when new infrastructure is provided or when land is rezoned for more intense or higher value uses. Stuff happens. <laughs> that's, the, that's the intervention we make and stuff happens. Land values go up. Development occurs. Early town planning legislation, both the UK and in Australia, made provision for betterment taxation. So there's nothing new under the sun. Um, betterment taxation or levies to capture a share of the value up uplift. Provision for betterment capture was introduced into the New South Wales Local Government Act in 1945, providing for 80% capture of the uplift if applied. And that's the schedule that was in the Victorian Act until 1987. Provision for ascertain, so this is, this, these are the sort of things which you can include in a, a planning scheme or an LEP in New South Wales speak. So provision for ascertaining whether and by what amount, if any, the value of any land is increased by the planning scheme, a levy of a betterment rate for the recovery of one half of that amount, uh, and for those purposes of applying any necessary adaptation of provision and act of these matters. So, so we've been there before, um, but the provision hasn't been included in uh, more recent rewrites of of state planning legislation. And Canberra, of course, because of its leasehold land system, has a betterment levy system in place. A lease variation charge equivalent to 75% of the uplift in value is paid with the granting of additional development rights. It should be stressed that value capture is not a panacea for our funding deficits. And these uh, private transport proponents are offered fixes. They think they're going to get 100% of uh, the infrastructure paid for through value capture. Furthermore, any system of value capture needs to be robust and fair. By the same token, we should be concerned at massive windfall gains which accrue to property owners or developers that stem from decisions or investments made by governments on behalf of the community. There is a clear market failure in these instances and a public interest case for change. The most obvious case where these windfalls accrue is the rezoning of industrial land for high density residential. And I see Chris Johnson picking up his ears at this point. <laughs> this, this can be illustrated by looking, looking at two large sites. Um, first is 7 and 9 Kent Road in Mascot, former industrial site owned by Goodman, now being developed as Mascot Central, a major mixed use development including 811 apartments. 386 service departments and 5,666 square metres of retail floor space, including the Woolworths supermarket. The second is a virtual town in its own right. The former British and American tobacco site in Pagewood is being developed with 2,733 dwellings over 10 years. So to provide an illustration of the value uplift which is generated, most of which will be captured by the developer where they've bought the site at its pre-zoning value. So they buy it as an industrial site, get the rezoning, and they get the uplift. I've prepared an estimate of the development profile for these type two sites, and I stress estimate. I don't know what the numbers are. I'm, I'm just going on uh, what, what, what we can find out. So we do know the mascot central site was purchased by Meriton from Goodman for $100 million. With stamp duty and holding costs, other on cost. The initial cost related to the land, including the $100 million sale price, may have been closer to $150 million. Development costs, factoring in a profit margin of 25%, so that's where the developers should be making their money on the development costs. They might be in the order of $700 million. So I've told you what the yield was, we've just run the numbers on possible construction costs. With revenues beginning to roll in as product is released, but probably ultimately in the order of 1.1 billion. That amount there. This assumes, actually, in this case, that the service departments return the same square metre rate returns as the apartments. <coughs> if you do a feasibility on see the service departments actually produces a little bit less uh, profit um, or less of a return, um, we've assumed that, the, that in this case some of those will turn over to, to residential. 
With these costs and revenues, the value of the land after the development is an estimated $450 million. So on the basis of these relatively conservative estimates, stressing that their estimates, the mere act of rezoning the site has increased the, the value of the land by about $300 million. So they bought the site at $100 million, at the end of the project it's worth $300 million, and they've also got 25% profit uh, on the way in the, in the development costs. Um, and um, there's been, as far as I can make out, no uh, voluntary planning agreement uh, in this case um, which might have uh, chipped away at some of that uh, land value uplift. Pagewood Green is a massive development, certainly coming with a lot of risks, but undertaking the same exercise suggests, uh, same exercise of profile and cost revenues suggests an uplift of around about $500 million in land value, from $380 million after on costs, $380 to about $875, and the difference is around about $500 million. Um, in this case, there were some off-site off contributions to, to via a VPA for upgrading some minor upgrades to road intersections. And the point here is not to blame or bemoan the actions of the developer, in this case, uh, Harry Triggerboff of Meriden. He's just operating with the system that exists, which expects nothing or very little to be returned to the community from the value created by the planning process. After all, you don't become Australia's richest man without being the beneficiary of access to rationed and effective monopoly rights to development. As he himself said, I bought the sites very cheap. He said it to the film review. So, good luck to you. Um, so, we've seen the same phenomenon at work um, with, a little, with more fanfare, actually. Um, it's always a bit more sexy when the mums and dads get in on the act. <laughs> uh, We've seen the same phenomenon work with the proposed rezoning of detached housing to high density residential around new rail stations on the Northwest Rail Line. And I went fishing for these headlines, and of course, the, the, the earlier reports had them all feuding, <laughs> feuding over the uplift. Um, then, the, then the real estate agents got involved and got, started giving them lectures about how they need to get organised, of course, um, and now they're smiling. Uh, big smiles about what's going on. So, uh, first the report said the residents were feuding, but then they got organised and are now banding together to sell multiple lots to developers. It makes sense. With the new rail, rail stations under construction and rezonings in prospect, house prices in Castle Hill have risen almost 80% over five years. Three adjoining blocks, three adjoining normal house blocks, close to the new showground station, were sold for $40 million with nine different developers vying for the site. 20 freestanding houses straddling three sites in Castle Hill tripled in value to about four million each when sold in aggregate. I won't talk to this slide, although it's another good story. Um, okay, so what's to be done here? What would a robust system of value capture look like? Well, there's perhaps five drivers of land value. You can aggregate them or dis disaggregate them, but let's talk about them as being five. The first three are linked and a bit hard to disentangle. disentangle. The first <coughs> is the intrinsic or general amenity characteristics of the land, reflecting its natural val values, e.g. proximity to water, green space, ed existing education facilities, but also the upkeep of historic investment in roads, schools, community facility. So we upkeep, as long as we're re re refunding or reinvesting in this, then the land value stays uh, at a good position. We also alluded to the idea of the scarcity of uh, Melbourne and Sydney as global cities. Um, population growth and economic development also boosts prices. It, it just has a, an impact on the price of land. So the city's scarcity value features here, and hence the escalating property values in global cities. So this image is intended to show the, the terrain or the contours of property values um, uh, without much in, the, in this being there, in this case. So we've got a bit of uplift along the main roads, around the parks, uh, at school perhaps. Um, the second thing which has a big impact, or another thing, another thing which has a big impact on land values, of course, is the uplift from state level investment in infrastructure, in particular transport infrastructure. 
This will have a distinguishable impact on land value, values, but it will still be overlaid on the existing land value co contours uh, driven by the, the other factors that I was talking about. So you start to get a slightly more complicated pattern. Um, then you rezone the precincts around the rail stations, providing for increased development rights, and in those areas, as we've seen, the land value goes up quickly. Um, it rises sharply and suddenly. None of any of those values, uh, those um, drivers of land value, have much to do with the actions of the landowner. Um, they're driven and created by government policy and investment, and they, be, and they can be distinguished from the fifth driver of value, which is the owner's investment in both buildings and other on-site improvements, and also in local infrastructure improvements paid for through things like Section 94 contributions. And they expect a profit, reasonably, on their investment in buildings, in the local infrastructure, etc. But um, the land value that's associated with these other things I've been talking about isn't anything to do with um, what they're uh, investing their money in. So there are already some mechanisms which operate as pseudo-value capture arrangements. And in fact, that's one of the problems that governments have got in trying to reform the system because there's already got a patchwork of things which exist. Capital gains tax, the federal tax, where, where it does apply to property transactions, uh, that's collected by the federal government. That's clearly a value capture tax. It's about the, the value of an asset changing. And special infrastructure charges um, at the state level are used to pay for some state level infrastructure charges. Uh, so, so, so used to pay for some state level infrastructure. And even though they're called uh, infrastructure charges, they're actually really bad at what um, so they, they have value capture characteristics. Um, and for example, special infrastructures are proposed to apply to new development in the Parramatta Light Rail Corridor. Voluntary planning agreements are used at local council level to capture value uplift for public benefits. But these, these mechanisms are, are pretty ad hoc. So reflecting on the sources of land value <coughs> uplift, and again I noticed Peter Phipps uh, had the same perspective when he gave a talk a few weeks ago, it seems clear that a two-pronged approach is appropriate. The first is a comprehensive land tax across all properties in the metropolitan area, which recognises the uplift comes from a variety of factors that I mentioned, including state-level transport infrastructure. To me, this approach is preferred to a flat levy, uh, which might apply within a designated corridor or local government area. So this approach of just a flat levy has been, has been used in the Gold Coast, where an annual levy of $120 applies to all properties. This funds a small portion of the cost of the Gold Coast light rail. It was also an approach which was used in the past for the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Melbourne Underground Loop. But the problem with that approach is that um, a flat levy on all properties isn't tied to the uplift in land values and may capture residents or households who don't particularly benefit from the transport investment. And both the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the uh, rate surcharge and the Melbourne Underground Loop levy were discontinued earlier than initially intend intended because they were seen as unfairly applying to properties that der didn't derive equivalent benefits. So the beauty of the land tax system is that of course it rises and falls with actual land value. I've suggested here that the, the land tax system, or the, the change, be branded a metropolitan transport levy. And to me, this would make the reform more politically palatable than a simple, simple broadening of the existing land tax base to include the family home, which is what is implied by this system. So at the moment, family homes are exempt from land tax, um, but we do have this pernicious stamp duty, which is a, uh, a tax on transactions, it's a tax on mobility, um, so, um, as well as, uh, uh, as the reform we've suggested here, the existing land tax system would need parallel reform um, and the stamp duty uh, system would need, the rate of stamp duty would need to fall and hopefully eventually be eliminated. And my view, it's a hard reform to do and we also would need the Commonwealth to be involved in the system. Easier to win politically, perhaps um, more of a challenge for Chris's membership, um, will be a bit of a betterment levy on new development which would have the character of a development licence fee. 
This recognises, and this is a different way of thinking about abetterment levy, this recognises that the community grants development rights on a rational basis. We have planning and we grant development, we have planning because we want a sensible outcome, therefore we don't just say you can have them and they go mad, we actually ration the development rights that we offer. So they have the characteristic of a development licence fee. These development rights have a value equivalent to the uplift in land value generated by the rezoning of the development approval. So such a system would have applied, perhaps could have applied in the Pagewood and Mascot example. The values would be based on a pre-existing schedule of rates for different types of floor space. Currently in New South Wales, voluntary planning agreements are being utilised to capture value uplift through a, a variety of approaches exist. There's insufficient certainty with such approaches and the system is open to gaming by both councils and developers. And Harry Trigoboff, again in the same article, was right to express his concerns. He argues councils are happy to approve more apartments so that they can get more money, but there's confusion and a lack of consistency over what the councils are going to charge. So we need to bring some certainty to the, to the process. So what we're proposing, or what I'm proposing here, is locally specific pre-scheduled rates would provide much more clarity. It would also enable the development assessment merits of proposals to be kept separate to decisions about how much value up it should be captured. It's critical for the integrity of the system that value capture isn't a stalking horse for out of proportion and excessive development. So that's the, that's the tension that we have as we, as we find uh, we like value capture more, we might like it too much <laughs> and we might be overdeveloping as a result. SGS has provided advice in relation to introducing this sort of pre-scheduled development rights levy approach for both the Victorian Government in its Melbourne Central City Bill Form Review and more recently for the Georges River Council um, for its voluntary planning agreements policy. So, the last slide. It's an exciting time for planning in Sydney and as I, as I mentioned, I really do believe the Greater Sydney Commission, cross my fingers, uh, will change the game uh, in relation to this. And so my hope is that planners are provided with and take the opportunity to re-engage re with the public interest and the issues and challenges that matter. And in my view, there are four, four in particular that I've talked about in this paper. Addressing the growing spatial disadvantage and social disparities that are likely to get worse as the city gets much bigger to the great cost of us all in terms of alienated communities and wasted lives. Secondly, ensuring that there is a dividend from growth and renewal and that planners demand that this be the case and that new development is measurably more livable and sustainable. Thirdly, relentlessly campaigning for action on the housing crisis, but through rigorous analysis and joined up thinking, highlighting the cost of inaction in and achieving the basic human right of shelter. Suggesting, fourthly, suggesting that the more enthusiastic advocates for value capture, take a cold shower <laughs> on what value capture might realistically deliver, but also pushing for, infor for reforms to insist that the community and not just landowners or developers should share the value created by the community when it invests in infrastructure and allows rezonings and approval which grant additional development rights. But I've also, but I hope I've also shown um, that persuasion will only follow when the public interest merit case is made through rigour and evidence, rather than relying on planning sentiment or mere assertion and hoping that the good will behind the carefully crafted words will carry the day. I think planners are find it sometimes are disappointed that the power of the word isn't enough. Our, our hearts are in it, you know, come on, you've got to believe us, we want it to change. Um, <laughs> But unfortunately it takes more and it takes the rigour and evidence. So the, that is a statement that the public policy world's moved on and planners need to have the evidence and arguments to compete. Thank you.